You might feel like the world's forgotten about you, your family's forgotten about you, your job's forgotten about you, maybe your spouse has forgotten about you, life has forgotten about you. Can I tell you the one person that has it, and his name's God. He didn't once forget about you. Before your life even started, he set up a plan to be able to have relationship with you through Jesus. Before you ever looked at him, he loved you. Before you ever prayed, he loved you. And he has never once forgotten about you. Can we take 10 seconds? Can we just worship Jesus and tell him how worthy he is, how deserving he is, how good he is? You're so good. Man, I'm glad that you made it to church today, whatever room you're in. I really believe God has you here on purpose. And it's not an accident that you made it into the seat that you're sitting in right now. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Sarah, like Pastor Aaron said. My husband and I have now been here for 10 years, which is crazy to think that I have, I'm even old enough to have been somewhere for 10 years. Um, but if you haven't met me, I have a picture of my family that I want to put up because we've grown since the last time that I was here. Um, so that little redhead, her name is Riley Ann Luisa. She's two, almost two and a half. And then that little boy is Robert John. He is three months and their personalities could not be more opposite. Um, he sleeps through the night already. Amen. God is good. And it's not because I'm great. It's because God's great. <laughs> um, but man, really quick, because it, we just recently became parents of more than one. Can I tell you, if you're a parent in the room and you have more than one kid, even if you have one kid, but I have gained so much respect for you. And I'm so proud that you made it to church today. You're setting an example for your family, but you should be proud of yourself for getting up, getting here. It's a big deal. We celebrate you. Whether or not they made it with shoes is okay. We had our first moment the other day with no shoes, and it's fine. It's okay. We got where we were going, and we're glad you're here. I want to take a second and honor Pastor Aaron and Katie. Um, without, yeah, y'all can celebrate them. They're amazing. Without them and this house, John and I actually wouldn't have probably ended up dating. Um, Radiant has a lot to do with our story, and um, I just want to tell you, too, now that we've known them for so long, um, they're the real deal. They love the Lord, they love each other, and they love you guys. They pray for you, they, they go to bat for you, they are in war, in prayer, believing for big things for your life. So I'm so glad you made it. He'll be back next Sunday, so if you're looking forward to him, don't worry, just come back next Sunday, um, and he'll be back. I'm so excited. I really believe God's got something for you today. So clearly, I believe that God puts you in the room on purpose. Maybe you don't even know how you wandered into one of our locations, which shout out to West Chase, shout out to online. Maybe you're not sure how you made it to the seat you're in. God had something to do with it. And I believe if you'll lean in today, he's got something for you. So you can write down what we're going to talk about. The title for today is what to do when you feel forgotten. And if you don't normally take notes, I'd encourage you to take notes today. Really lean in. Don't let this just be another service. Lean in, press in, pay attention, focus. And let's believe we'll leave here a little different. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that there is joy in your presence. Thank you that you're a good father. I pray that you would, um, that you'd be so present in every room to everyone listening, that we would leave here changed. We'd leave here encouraged. And God, I pray that you would give hope today. Deposit hope, deposit encouragement. Would you speak today? We're listening. In Jesus' name, everybody said, oh, come on, everybody said, we're going to go a little old school today, if that's okay. We're going to go to the Old Testament. And so if you've been in the church for a while, maybe you've heard this story before. Um, if you haven't been in the church for a while, that's okay. We're going to go through the story together. And it's in Genesis 29. It's the story of Jacob and Rachel. Anybody familiar with the story of Jacob and Rachel? If you're not, that's okay, because we're going to read it together anyway, so it's fine. Um, so we're going to start in Genesis 29, verse 16. It says, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, say Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Say Rachel. Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, which is the Bible's way of saying she was U-G-L-Y. You ain't got no alibi. She was not the attractive sister. But Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your daughter, Rachel. Laban is Rachel's father. Laban said, it's better that I give you to her than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. That alone is a word for someone. If he ain't willing to text you back, this guy's willing to work seven years. He ain't worth it. That's not the message for today, but we're going to pause right there. They seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Oh, so cute. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. Little assertive. 
My time is completed and I want to make love to her. Also a little assertive. So Laban brought together all of the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant to his daughter as an attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Read your Bible slow. Can we acknowledge what just happened? Because if you read that story really quick, you think, oh, it's a cute little love story. This is messed up. This is like a telenovela that I watched growing up. This is some saucy stuff that's happening here. So Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, got the approval, worked seven years. At night, I don't know what his eyes looked like because he didn't notice till the morning that it was actually not Rachel. It was the other sister and said, oh, shoot, this is not what I signed up for. And uh, growing up in youth group, as a youth group kid, I was raised in church. My mom's still in ministry. She is amazing. Um, I always wanted to be the, the Rachel in this story. Like, oh, where's my, where's my Jacob that's willing to work seven years for me? And if you're a guy, maybe you're like, where's the Rachel I'm willing to work seven years for her father to find? Um, but they're actually not the focus of this story that we're going to focus on. Um, we're actually going to focus on Leah, because if we acknowledge what happened to her in this whole story, there's a whole dynamic of a forgotten character that we can overlook really quickly. Um, so first, let's skip to the end part of our story, and we're going to backtrack a little bit and talk about Leah. So let's go to verse 31. It's where we're going to hang out for today. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant, gave birth to a son, named him Reuben, and said, it's because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. And then she conceived again and gave birth to a third son. She said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons and named him Levi. And this is the fourth time she conceived again and gave birth to a son, said this time I will serve the Lord or praise the Lord and named him Judah. And then she stopped having children. Leah's story is often overlooked in scripture because we always focus on the beautiful story of Jacob and Rachel. And I think there's some people in here today, if you're honest, that you feel like the Leah in your own story, that you feel forgotten. And you're exactly the person that God wants to talk to today. See, my husband turned 30 this last week, which is a big deal. And he's very, um, I don't know, he likes to walk down memory lane a lot. He's very sentimental. I'm not that way, but he turned 30. So we went down memory lane. And we're going back to high school. And I remember my senior year of high school, um, I had a couple things happen to me that made me feel super forgotten. So I didn't want to get married. I was one of those people growing up. So I didn't date because if the purpose of dating is marriage, I didn't want to date because I didn't want to get married. So I didn't. Um, but then there was this guy that started coming to the church that I was in. And when he worshiped y'all, he like hands up, fully singing, knew the words. He would kneel. He was like all in. I said, oh, that's attractive. And so um, my, our parents noticed that we started to have, you know, a little connection. And so we started all hanging out together. And um, I thought this is going great. This is awesome. And then he left for the summer. Um, he was joining the military. So he had some training he had to do. And we couldn't talk to him for a couple weeks. And then he invited us to this big celebration to celebrate the end of his big training. And I was so excited. So I went with my mom to pick out an outfit. And um, we're at the checkout line with the outfit in hand. And my mom gets a Facebook message. And she said, oh, why don't you read this before we buy this outfit? And I was like, what could you have gotten on Facebook that could have, you know, changed my mind? And he messaged my mom and said, hey, I actually have to tell you something. I have a girlfriend. It's not your daughter. My family doesn't know I have a girlfriend and they don't like her. So please don't say anything and please come to the celebration so your daughter can still be there because they like her. Ick, lots of ick. I was very upset. Um, but because my mom was who she was, she said, let's just go. And we still went and it was terrible. And that's a whole message for another day. Um, <laughs> so that happened, which left me very confused as uh, going into my senior year of high school, very abandoned feeling and second choice feeling. And then four weeks later, my grandpa, who was the rock of our family, my favorite person, he's actually the one my son is named after, unexpectedly passed away, had a fall, passed away. And it left to me feeling so forgotten, forgotten by people, forgotten by family, forgotten by God, forgotten by life. And maybe for you, it's not a love triangle like 
this Bible story, or maybe for you it's not like the story I had, which was its own little love triangle and a lot of heartbreak, but maybe for you it was a bill that came in the mail that you weren't expecting, and you look at your bank account, and you're like, oh, I'm forgot. I don't know what's going to happen here. Or maybe it's a health diagnosis that you thought this time it'll, the medication will work, or this time the surgery will, will work and do what it's supposed to do, and it doesn't happen. Or maybe for you it's a breakup that came, and you were not expecting it, or a relational issue that happened, or you know, maybe something happened at your job and you're overlooked for a promotion and you feel so forgotten by people and family and life and God, if you're being honest. And you find yourself in the same place that Leah probably felt. Forgotten by family, forgotten by everyone, forgotten by God. And Leah does three things that I think if we can do these same three things, we'll actually get to see a lot of fruit out of our life and not waste the, fr- the season where we feel forgotten. And the first thing that she does is she stayed faithful. What I think is so interesting about her story is that she had every right to feel like, why am I in this marriage? I didn't ask for this. I didn't choose this person. They didn't choose me. I'm just here because of tradition, because I'm the oldest. Like, he doesn't want me. But she viewed her commitment as not a commitment to a person, not a commitment to a situation, not a commitment to her feelings, not a commitment to her family or her father or her friends. She viewed that as a commitment to God. And she stayed faithful when it got hard. I think there's a lost art of staying power in our world today. I think when it's convenient for us to leave and we feel we have the right to, we're out. It's really, really difficult to find those that are willing to stay put and stay faithful even when it's difficult. Uh, before we started having kids, um, I, me and my husband love to run. Any runners in here? Some crazy people? We're the crazy ones. I understand. We're the ones that are weird. Um, I love to run. I still love to run. Um, and so we decided in 2020 that we were going to do our first half marathon. We were so excited. We'd never done anything this far before. And so we're training, we're training, and we decided to run it on two separate days just in case one of us had to call 911 for the other one if we were passed out somewhere. Because we did it in the summer in Florida, which was crazy. I don't recommend. Um, So he did it first. He was great. Did it. Congratulations. Then the next weekend, it was my turn. And so I'm like feeling good. Anyone know like the runner's high you get? It's like you feel really good. It's the same feeling when you sip a milkshake for the first time, if I'm being honest. But it was awesome. And so we're like running. And I get to where I have less than one mile left. And I'm done. I was like, I don't know if I can make it. I want to crawl. I was like on the side of the road, um, very public. Like we didn't even go somewhere where no one knows us. Like we're in South Tampa running on the side of Dale Mabry and I'm done. And so I called my husband. I said, can you please pick me up? I don't think I can make it home. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm less than a mile from the house. And he said something that made me so angry in that moment. But I think it's something somebody needs to hear today too. He said, I'm not going to pick you up because you'll be so mad if you quit because you have less than a mile left, you will be more angry at yourself if you quit. And I think some people in the room, you're so close to where you want to be in life. You're so close to the breakthrough you've been praying for. You're so close to the relationship being healed. You're so close to a promotion. You're so close to the miracle God has. You're less than a mile left and you're calling, you're saying, I'm out. I'm done. Someone pick me up. And I'm here to tell you today, and I'm on the phone telling you, don't quit. You'll be so mad that you did. You'll be so mad that you quit. You're almost there. You're less than a mile from the miracle that God has for you. Don't quit. Albert Einstein said, I love this quote. He said, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. He just stayed in it longer. It would be easier to leave. It'd be easier to just, well, if they didn't figure it out, they didn't solve it. I'm just going to yeet myself out of here too. And he said, no, I'm going to stay in this longer. And I think a lot of times we get to this place and I'm not a gardener, so I had to buy these plants. These are not like from my garden. Um, But we're like this plant and we're frustrated and focused on them and we feel forgotten because this is a bigger plant and they have more flowers on theirs and they have a bigger pot than we do. And so instead of just staying, we actually decide to pull ourselves out and say, I'm done, I'm leaving. It must be, it must be, you know, whatever. It's not meant to be. And we leave ourselves and we get out of the soil of life, the soil of that relationship, the soil of our relationship with God, the soil of the dream team, the small group, the church God has for you, showing up for your kids, showing up for your family, and you pluck yourself out. And I think the enemy would love nothing more than for us to be our own reason why we die on the vine and he didn't have to do anything else. Because we did it to ourselves. We pulled ourselves out and said, I'm, I'm done. And I wonder what would happen if we got back to staying faithful. Staying faithful where God put us. 
staying faithful to him when life feels confusing, staying faithful even though we feel forgotten. See, the definition of faithful, you can write it in your notes, is remaining loyal and steadfast. Remaining loyal and steadfast. God will always be faithful to us, and he is the perfect picture of remaining loyal and steadfast. And I want to challenge you today, what if we did that in return to God and said, I'm going to remain loyal and steadfast, just like Leah did? Because if we're all being honest, a lot of us probably wouldn't have stayed. That's a hard situation she was in. And a lot of people that we would have surrounded ourselves with probably would have said, you have every right to leave. And she stayed faithful, even when she felt forgotten. Number two, the second thing that she did is she stayed fruitful. Fruitful. This is key, and it is so not the thing we want to do in hard seasons. Because when we are in a forgotten season, we make this little bubble where life is all about us, don't we? Our own little feelings, this is what happened, and we try to bring as many people along with us as we can, don't we? Well, do you know what they did? You should stop going to small group too. Do you know what they did? Did you see where they were on Instagram? You should stop hanging out with them. Did you see that DM that he sent her? Oh, you better talk to him. Did you see that? Did you see that? And you're looking at everyone else and you're making it all about yourself. And life was never meant to be about ourselves. Our life should be about something bigger than us, right? Because at some point our life is going to end and I want my life to outlast me. I want there to be something left behind that was bigger than me. So I need to be fruitful for that to happen even when I feel forgotten. John 15 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Here's how to have fruit. You ready? If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's the key to having fruit, remaining in God. And let me remind some people who maybe have been to church a long time and you've heard that verse a lot and you think remain is just you and Jesus, just in your room. Oh, I'm remaining with God. Can I tell you, remaining is a verb. It's an action statement. You have to do some things to get the result you're looking for. See, write it in your notes. Work is what produces fruit. Work is what produces fruit. You can't just put a seed in the ground and expect it to do something and grow. It actually requires something of you as the caretaker of the plant to produce fruit. It requires something you, of you and your relationship with Jesus to get the fruit you're looking for. It's not just going to happen immediately and automatically salvation is going to be automatic, but living a life of significance is not going to be. Neither is having fruit. And a lot of times we don't produce fruit because we feel forgotten. So we're like, well, if God forgot about us, I'm going to forget about him. But can I tell you something? Because God told Joshua something in Deuteronomy that I think he'd say to you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. What that tells me is he's never left me. He never will leave me. He's never forgotten about me. He never will forget about me. He's always had grace for me in the past. He'll have grace for me in the future. He's never stopped showing up for me. He never will stop showing up for me. So if he's not going to stop, I'm not going to stop either. If he's going to continue to pursue me and be faithful, then I'm going to be faithful too because I want my life to count for something and he's never left you and he won't. So if he's not, then you shouldn't. Don't show up just for yourself. Be fruitful and write it in your notes because if you make an effort, it'll make a difference. A lot of times we think it's this big thing we have to do and you know, well, it has to be this grand thing and and I've dug myself in such a hole that I can't just start doing little things again for God. I got to do a big thing. Just make an effort. Just do something. You already did. You showed up at church. That's an effort. That means something. Want to know some other ways, some guaranteed ways to produce fruit in your life? Because these are very basic. These are not going to be theologically beautiful. They're going to be very basic and biblical. These are guaranteed ways to produce fruit. Number one, prayer. Prayer. Just pray. Just talk to God. It doesn't have to sound fancy. It doesn't have to sound like all these flowery words and a long search. Just talk to God. God, I'm frustrated. God, I'm upset. God, where are you? And I guarantee if you spend some time in prayer, you're going to see fruit because of it. Number two, read the word. And I think this is usually the one that gets put on the back burner first, isn't it? We're like, well, I don't hear anything from you. I feel forgotten. I'm not going to read the word. Until you talk to me, I'm not going to read it again. Until I understand it, I'm not going to read it again. But if you read it, it's guaranteed to do something in your life. Because the more you deposit God's words in you, you're going to see fruit come out of you. And the last thing is serve. Serve at church. 
Serve your family. Serve your kids. Serve your spouse. Serve your friends. Serve your small group. You know, nobody dislikes the person who serves everyone else. Nobody dislikes the person who brings coffee for everyone else in the morning. We love that guy, don't we? We're like, you can stick around forever. I'll give you a promotion. Be the person. Don't stop serving. Don't stop because it feels uncomfortable. Don't stop doing what you know to do when you feel how you feel. Because too often we let our feelings lead our actions. Feelings are the caboose. They're in the back. Actions are the engine that need to be leading your life forward. Don't stop doing what you know to do just because you feel how you feel. One definition of feeling, I thought this was so powerful this week. It's a subjective response to a person, thing, or situation. So I wonder what would happen if we changed our subjective response to match the magnitude of the God that we serve. What if our response stopped being a knee-jerk reaction to what life throws at you, and it's actually a response to how big God is and how big and wonderful and amazing and miraculous the size of the God is that we serve rather than how big the situation feels? Howard Jendrick says, how big is your God? Because the size of your God determines the size of everything. So my question to you is, how big is your God? Is the God you serve big enough to still produce joy in a hard situation? Is the God you serve big enough to still be good when you feel forgotten and when life doesn't feel good? Is the God you serve big enough to still keep his promise when people don't? Is the God you serve big enough to still be deserving when life is hard? Here's the thing about God. God can feel like a genie in your life, but he certainly won't act like one. He will not be treated like a a genie in your life and just give you every single thing that you need because he actually knows what you need. You know what you want. Right now we're teaching our toddler. It's so funny in in the car. She says, I need Lion King song. I need Lion King song. I'm like, girlfriend, you don't need the Lion King song. I actually really don't need the Lion King song. I'm trying to teach her you want to listen to a song. God actually knows what you need, and it's usually bigger than what you want. See, you can serve the God of revelation or the God of your own imagination, but you cannot serve both. One is real and one's not. That's a word. Just going to leave that there. You can write it in your notes. Fruit isn't just the indicator of if the plant is healthy, but it's an indicator of if the gardener is present. We can throw a lot of seeds around and sit back and cross our arms and be real frustrated that it's not doing anything. And looking at everybody else's garden, like, look, look, look. Their prayers are getting answered. Look, their marriage is going well. She got engaged. Look, they're pregnant. Look, they got a promotion and be so angry that our seeds aren't doing anything. But you actually have to put in some work and be present as the gardener for fruit to happen. I have a question for you. Is your life producing fruit? If you're honest. I did some research on um, flowers this week because, again, I'm not a gardener. So I I have nothing to offer. But Google does. And so it's funny because it usually takes two weeks to see something germinate when you plant a seed. It takes a flower to actually produce a flower, 50 to 60 days. And this one was crazy to me. Lavender takes between two to five years before it's matured. And we're frustrated over here that it's not just instant. God, I gave my life to you. Why is my marriage fixed? God, I'm, I'm serving you at church. Why is my bank account full? God, I work harder than them. Why didn't I get the promotion? But there's a lot of work that's going on. And if you know the work you're putting in behind the scenes, God will make sure that it's in front of everybody one day. But he also knows the lack of work that's going on behind the scenes. And if you can't handle it when he wants to give it to you, he's going to keep it behind the scenes until you're ready. Or God forbid, put it in front of everybody. And you're like, oh no, I didn't put in the work. Stay fruitful. Do the things you know to do are going to produce good fruit. And the last thing, and this is the one that has been messing me up, part of her story, is stay focused. Stay focused. I'm going to reread that last part of our story today in Genesis 29. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her. I want to pause there for a second. God sees what you're feeling, and he acts on it. He is not absent in your fear, in your forgottenness, in your frustration. He sees it and is acting when Leah saw, or Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Now, stay with me through this. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, first son, named him Reuben, said, it's because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived 
again, number two, gave birth to a son and said, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave me this one too. And she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived, number three, gave birth to a son and said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Named him Levi. Conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, this fourth one, this time, I will praise the Lord. And she named him Judah and stopped having children. Now, maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but let me tell you the significance of who Judah is. See, Jacob had chose Rachel, right? That was the one that he worked seven years for and then another seven years to be able to be with her. But God chose Leah to give birth to Judah where eventually Jesus came from. Jesus didn't come from Rachel, the one everybody else looked at, the one that looked like the one who'd be the promised child, the one that everyone else gave the attention to, the one that got the promotion, the one that looked more attractive, the one that was smarter, the one that was prettier, the one that was first pick. God didn't pick her. God picked Leah, the forgotten one, the overlooked one, the one in the background, the one behind the scenes, the one who stayed faithful, stayed fruitful, and stayed focused. That's who God picked. If you don't believe me, you can look at the genealogy of Jesus. In Matthew 3 and in Luke 1, it says that Jesus came from Judah, who came from Leah. So what I want to challenge you today is to stop looking for the acceptance of people when you've received the acceptance of God. Leah wasn't still out there looking for, oh, Jacob, would you love me? Would you love me? It wasn't until she got her attention off of the fact that her husband wasn't going to love her, and that's its own situation in itself. But she finally said, this time, this time I'll praise the Lord. This time, the fourth time. She didn't give up on number one. She didn't give up on number two. She didn't give up on number three. It was the fourth time. So when you don't get the result you're looking for with the first seed, try again. When you don't get the result you're looking for with the first relationship, just try again. When you don't get the result you're looking for in the small group, try another one. Try another dream team. Keep showing up on Sunday. Don't quit and stay focused on the right thing. Because it was when she focused on God that she got the result that she needed. It matters where you focus. It matters where you focus because here's the reality. You don't just reap what you sow, but you also reap where you sow. You want to know why you're frustrated? Because you just keep looking at the frustration. Frustration is going to reap more frustration. You want to know why you have friends that all gossip? It's because you all gossip and you keep getting more friends that gossip. And so you're just going to have more friends that gossip. Where are you putting your attention today? Where are you focusing? Because that's where you're going to see benefits. That's where you're going to reap from. Something doesn't just grow on its own. There's a seed that's planted and cared for. So watch where you're sowing. You can write it in your notes. Whatever you're focused on is what you're filled with. Whatever you're focused on is what you're filled with. Focus on the right thing. I want to be filled with joy and hope and love and kindness, and something that's going to outlive me, and legacy. And to do that, that means I have to focus on the God who is those things. Because this is the reality. When you focus on what's broken, it will never make you whole. We focus on all the things other people get. Well, look, their prayer got answered. Look, they got the man they were praying for. They got the promotion. They got their healing. They got all the things that I'm wanting. And so you're focusing on this and you're focusing on all the broken things and all the issues. And your eyes are so over here that you can't even see if God's doing something over here. And maybe your miracle's right behind you. Maybe the thing you've been praying for is over here, but you're so focused on other things that you can't see the thing God's trying to give you. It wasn't until she got her eyes off of her husband, off of what made her feel forgotten, that she got to get the breakthrough and end up in the line of Jesus. Focusing on them will never fix you, no matter how hard you try to make it work. It's never going to happen. It's not going to give you what you want. It's not going to give you what you need. I was, um, I was dropping my daughter off this week for school and I was, um, like practicing this out loud. And you guys ever have those moments in your car where you're doing something and you're like, if anyone looks in my car right now, I'm going to look like a psycho. You know, I, um, I actually, in my small group this last week, someone said when she prays out loud in her car, she holds the phone to her ear just in case someone looks in the car because they just want to look like they're talking to someone. It's so funny. Um, it's funny because now her daughter will just be talking out loud to no one in the car. And she turned around and said, what are you doing? She's like, I'm praying, mom. She's like, well, not quite, but you get the concept. Like you're talking out loud. And, and so I was practicing this week in the car and I was praying for you. And I was praying over this message and I was praying. I said, God, what, 
what do you want to, to say? And, and I was going through this and I've never had this happen, but I had such a clear moment where God put the weight on me of how some people are feeling that you feel like everyone's forgotten about you. And I'm just crying in my car, like trying to drop my daughter off at school. Like, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm not late today. <laughs> like, I'm a mess because I know that God sees how you're feeling. He sees the people that left you. He sees the opportunities that didn't end up working out the way you wanted them to. He sees all your friends that got all the things you wanted. He sees how frustrated you are with your health right now and the diagnoses that keep happening and the surgery after surgery and the medicine after medicine and the prayer after prayer and it's not going the way you want it to go. And I just felt the weight of the fact that God sees you. He sees how you're feeling. He sees and feels the weight that you're carrying. But then as I'm praying, he also wants to tell you that he doesn't just see it. He wants to do something about it. He wants you to know how much he loves you. That before you were ever born and before you had an opportunity to feel the way you're feeling, he loved you so much. And he put you first that he sent his own son to take the weight of every mistake you've made, every hurt you've carried, all the baggage. He paid the price for all of it on the cross and he didn't do it with the guarantee that you'll say yes to a relationship with him. Before you ever said yes, before we did anything to look in God's direction, before we even had an off chance of even saying, okay, maybe I'm in a relationship with God. Maybe I wanna end up in church one day. Before any of that, he took a chance and said, I, I want a relationship with you. You might not know it yet, but I have a plan for you. You might not feel it yet, but I love you. You might feel forgotten by everybody else, but you're my first choice. You might feel like the world's forgotten about you, your family's forgotten about you, your job's forgotten about you, maybe your spouse is forgotten about you, life is forgotten about you. Can I tell you the one person that hasn't, and his name's God. He didn't once forget about you. Before your life even started, he set up a plan to be able to have relationship with you through Jesus. Before you ever looked at him, he loved you. Before you ever prayed, he loved you. And he has never once forgotten about you. So if you would close your eyes in this room, there's two groups of people I want to take a second and pray over. And the first is, is if you feel forgotten, overlooked, second choice, that's you I want to pray for you because I've been there I know what it feels like but I just want to pray that God would be so close to you and that you'd be so aware of how much he loves you so if you feel forgotten you feel overlooked you feel like this I just need someone to pray over me would you put your hand in the air and just wave it at me so I can see who I'm praying for you're not alone let me pray for you God you see everyone whose hand was lifted God you see how they're feeling you see why they've ended up feeling this way. You see the life circumstances that have brought them to this point. You see all the things that have led them in their life to this moment right now. God, I pray that you would make your presence so real to them. That they would rest in knowing how loved they are. And that your love is actually action. That you loved enough to do something and you sent your son. God, I pray for your peace over their mind, over their life. When the enemy tries to mess with them and say, you're forgotten, you're forgotten. God left you. God left you. Holy Spirit, I pray just a barrier of protection up against their, in their mind, against what the enemy would have them think, and that they would be reminded this week, I am loved by God. I am loved by God. I am seen by him. He's never once forgotten about me. He never will. He's never left me. He never will. He sees me. There's a second group of people in the room I want to talk to, and that's if you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you don't know how you ended up in the seat you're in, or you said, I'll just give him one last shot because everyone else has not worked out, or whatever has brought you to this point, and you just want to start a relationship with Jesus. I want to pray for you because today could be that day. He loves you so much that he sent his son to pay the price for every mistake you've made, die a horrific death. He was raised to life three days later, and he would love for you to say yes. So if that's you and you want to start a relationship with Jesus, on the count of three, would you wave your hand at me and put it right back down just so I know who I'm praying for? If you want to start a relationship with Jesus, just raise your hand. One, two, three. All over the room if you want to start a relationship. I see you. 
I see you. I see you. God sees you. All of our locations online, God sees you. Would you do me a favor? Would you repeat after me this prayer? And we're all going to say it together. But know that God is hearing you. Say, dear Jesus, today I make a decision to follow you. Forgive my past, my present, and my future. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Help me follow you all the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate those who just made that decision? Well, thank you so much for watching Radiant Church YouTube channel. Don't forget, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to this channel right now. You can click the button so you don't miss anything. You can support the ministry by sharing this message with a friend or by clicking the Give Now button that you see on your screen so that we can continue to see lives changed for Jesus. Thanks for watching. The best is yet to come.